Our first scripture reading today comes from Mark's Gospel, the ninth chapter, beginning at the 14th verse. Listen for God's word as it comes to us. When they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and some scribes arguing with them. And when the whole crowd saw Jesus, they were immediately overcome with awe and they ran forward to greet him. He asked them, what are you arguing about with them? Someone from the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought you my son. He has a spirit that makes him unable to speak. And whenever it seizes him, it dashes him down and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. And I asked your disciples to cast it out, but they could not do so. He answered them, you faithless generation, how much longer must I be among you? How much longer must I put up with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. And when the spirit saw him immediately, it convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. It has often cast him into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you are able to do anything, have pity on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you are able, all things can be done for the one who believes. And immediately the father of the child cried out, I believe, help my unbelief. When Jesus saw the the crowd running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You spirit that keeps this boy from speaking and hearing, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. After crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out, and the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he was able to stand. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second scripture reading comes from Mark 11, verses 20 through 24. It starts off, it says, In the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. And then Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. Jesus answered them, Have faith in God. Truly I tell you, if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and if you do not doubt in your heart, but believe what you say will come to pass, it will be done for you. So I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. This is the word of the Lord. So we are doing our sermon series called God in Science, and each week we're looking at the various ways that we can find God through the study in the field of science. And last week, we talked about this idea that our environments can literally change the way our cells read our DNA. And after that sermon, I had a number of people come up to me and say things, because I talked about addiction, and I had a number of people come up and say, you know, I have family members who are suffering from drug addiction, and this was very helpful for me to understand perhaps a different way that God can help them out of this place. But I also heard on the flip side of that, a lot of people came up to me and said, there was a lot of science in that sermon that you did. A lot of science. And so I wanted to just say something because I heard that from a number of people. And and all that to say, for these first few, we are going to be talking about a lot of science. But I'm laying foundation because we're going to keep coming back to these themes over and over again. And so once you have what we've talked about after these first few, you're going to see how they all kind of interweave together later on as we get further into this series. So I just want to put that out there so everybody knows where we're headed. So today we're talking about how our environments affect our perception of the world. And I want to start by actually having you participate in a little experiment. Would you be willing to do that? Okay. Up on the screen, you're going to be watching a video. In this video, you're going to see two different groups of people. It's going to be a team of people in white shirts, a team of people in black shirts. Your goal 
is to count the number of passes performed by the team in the white shirts. They're going to be throwing a ball around. You want to count those passes. Can you do that? Yep. All right. Let's watch. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball. The correct answer is 16 passes. Now, how many got the right answer, 16 passes? All right. How many of you all saw the gorilla walking around in the background? OK. Now, I want to watch the video again. And there was a gorilla in the background. But there's actually a lot more going on than just the gorilla that you probably missed. So let's watch that video again, and I want you to just see kind of what's going on. Okay, let's watch it one more time. Did you spot the gorilla? For people who haven't seen or heard about a video like this before, about half missed the gorilla. If you knew about the gorilla, you probably saw it. But did you notice the curtain changing color or the player on the black team leaving the game? Let's rewind and watch it again. Here comes the gorilla, and there goes a player, and the curtain is changing from red to gold. When you're looking for a gorilla, you often miss other unexpected events. And that's the monkey business illusion. All right. Now, the point of watching this is to reveal two things. The first thing is that our brains tend to block out a lot of things that are going on in our environment. And the second thing that it's to point out is that it's hard for us to focus on more than one thing at a time. Would we agree with those two points that this video kind of shows us? OK. So when you were there trying to watch them pass the ball, you were using what we call your conscious brain, because you had to sit there and you had to go one, two, three, and so on. Now your conscious brain, that is what makes you different from every other organism on the planet. It is an amazing thing that you can sit there and you can actively calculate the number of passes. I mean, because you've seen a dog, right? Have you seen a dog that's watching a ball? They can watch the ball wherever it goes, but they cannot count how many times the ball has gone back and forth in the way that you can. And so, in that way, you are different. And what gives you that ability is that our prefrontal cortex, this front part of our brain, is much more highly evolved than other organisms. And what does our prefrontal cortex do? What well, allows humans to create buildings just like this. It allows humans to engineer computers, to make plans for the future, and most importantly, to imagine. Now, as much as your prefrontal cortex enhances your internal world, there is a limit to the amount of information that your prefrontal cortex, your conscious mind, can absorb. On average, your conscious mind can take in about 40 bits of information per second. Now, that's not very much, particularly when you contrast it to your subconscious mind, which can take in 40 million bits of information per second. Now, what's the difference between your conscious and your subconscious mind? Well, your subconscious is your monkey brain. That's the brain that you inherited from your monkey ancestors. It came down the line. That's the part that you took over. And then what happened was, over time, our brain grew over top of that. Now, the reason why the monkey brain is so much more powerful is because it's had millions of years to evolve, whereas our brain has only really been evolving in the way it is now for the last 100 years thousand years. To give you a sense of the difference between these two brains, I'd like to take you back to when you were first learning how to drive a car. So, do you remember when you were learning how to drive a car as a teenager? Okay. Most of you were horrible at it, okay? I was horrible at driving a car when I was a teenager. No, I'm sure some of you, I was great at driving a car when I was a teenager, right? 
Okay, the reason why we're not very good at it is because that when you're driving, right, when you're driving this car, you're using your conscious mind to drive. That's how you're learning, right? And of course, when you drive, there's all of this stuff going on around you in your environment. And it's really hard when your conscious mind is the one looking at it to take all of that in because how much information is it taking in? 40 bits of information per second. And you miss a lot. And as a result, this is why first time drivers tend to get in a lot of accidents and your insurance is so high. But after a number of months and years of driving, you get much better at it, right? And this is because your conscious mind is no longer driving the car, but your subconscious has taken over. For proof of this, have you ever been in a car with someone and you get into a really intense conversation eh, slash argument where you're talking with someone and it gets really intense and then you get to your destination and you don't even remember how you got there, right? Now, the reason why this is happening is because while you're sitting there focused on your conversation, your subconscious is driving the car, which sounds super dangerous. But actually, it's way better for everyone when your subconscious is driving because it's taking in 40 million bits of information per second while you're sitting there trying to make your point. Now, looking at between these two things, it might be very apparent to you. You might be thinking to yourself, well, given the difference between the conscious and the subconscious, why wouldn't we want everything to be in the subconscious mind? And it is true that there are many, many things that we are much better off if they are in the subconscious. So, for instance, let me give you another example. Playing sports. So when you're first learning how to play a sport, you're usually really bad at it because you have to learn the technique and the skills. So you gotta learn how to hit that baseball. You gotta learn how to swing the racket. You gotta learn how to kick the ball properly, right? You have to learn how to do all these things. But over time, when it goes from the conscious, where you have to consciously think about it, to the subconscious, you're much better because you're no longer thinking about how to do it. What are you doing? You're reacting based on instinct. Another example would be playing music. So Adam, when he gets up there in first service, he's playing the guitar and he's singing at the same time. Now the way he's able to do both of those tasks simultaneously is that he has learned the guitar so well that he can essentially play that with his subconscious and he can focus on singing the words that are on the page in front of him. Now, all of these examples, you probably should have noticed something interesting about them. The driving, sports, right, music, is that our subconscious is really good at helping us with tasks and skills, things like that. Where our subconscious is not so helpful, and indeed can hurt us quite substantially, is in understanding who we are as people. So what I want to do now is I want to explain to you how our subconscious is programmed. So you need to follow me on this because really this whole sermon hinges on this part of it. So from the ages of zero all the way until 12, that is when we are programming our subconscious mind. And the primary years where that happens is usually from the ages of two to six. Now, from the time you were born until the age of two, your brain is operating at the lowest level of brain activity. It's called EEG activity. EEG stands for electroencephalograph. It's how we measure brain activity. Have you ever seen on, like, on a video or in a movie those little things that go up and down on the piece of paper? Okay, that's the electrical activity. Now, when you're first born, your primary level of brain activity is known as delta. When you're in delta waves, it's like your brain is behind a pane of glass. That's what's happening. You're looking out. And so Adam, he has a little baby. How old is she? 14 months. 14 months. So she's still in that stage. She's starting to come out of it right now where she can react pretty much mostly based on instinct. But particularly when they're little, little, right, and they can't do much, it's like they're just observing the world. But as they come out of that, as they get towards two years old, they move into the next higher level phase of their brain activity, which is known as theta. Now, you all experience theta every single night when you sleep because our brains lapse into theta when we dream. And this is why little kids have such vivid imaginations. 
Because for them, there is almost no difference between the real world and the dream world. They are together as one. And so when they're imagining, they're not really imagining. Like you and I, let's say we see a box, right? And we think we're playing with our kids, and they look at that, and they say, that's a house. Now to us, we have to imagine it's a house, right? To them, it's a house. There is no difference between those two things. So from the ages of about two to six is when you are taking in a lot of information. When you're in theta, you are sucking in information. And you're doing that because you have to learn a lot about the world. Just think back. Traditionally, our ancestors, who were walking around the woods, between the ages of two and six, you needed to learn a lot of information very quickly if you were going to survive, right? So, have you ever been with like little kids? My kids are between the ages of two and six. Have you ever sat there and thought to yourself, are these kids listening to anything I'm saying? Like, they are taking in everything that you are saying. They are watching it all. And the reason why is because they're observing their parents and they're learning about all of the behaviors, all of the attitudes, all the beliefs. They are watching those and those things are getting locked into the subconscious of their brain because it's teaching them how to navigate the world. So let's go back. How many bits of information are taken in by the subconscious brain? 40 million bits of information per second. Now a good way to imagine the subconscious brain is, is a, it's like a tape recorder. And it's literally just recording everything that happens for the first 12 years of your life. And once it's finished recording, it just plays over and over again for the rest of your life. Now, here's the problem with the subconscious. The problem is that when it's being programmed, those primary years between 2 and 6, there is some that happens between 6 and 12, but mostly between 2 and 6, that's when you're learning how to navigate the world, and you end up making a lot of mistakes. So if your parents, when they sit there and they watch you make a mistake, if they sit there and they say, you're stupid, you're an idiot, you don't know what you're doing, you're clumsy, you don't deserve anything, or even worse, you should have never been born, all of that gets lodged in the subconscious and it plays over and over again for the rest of your life. You see, the problem for children is that they can't differentiate between when their parent is correcting their behavior and when the parent is making a statement about them as a person. For a child, all of those comments are downloaded as absolute facts that later in life become truths that dictate our behavior and our potential as adults. Can I say that again? Because that's really important. They download all of those comments into their brain as absolute facts that later in life become truths that dictate our behavior and our potential as adults. I have very vivid memories of my mother when I was young telling me that I was stupid. Now my mom, she was doing that probably based on the fact that I was acting stupid at the time, but I will tell you that had a significant impact on my self-esteem when I was growing up. I would say until about the age of 30, I considered myself to be a very unintelligent person. Part of the reason why I went to all those fancy schools is because I wanted to prove to myself and to my mother that I was a smart person. But yet, even after going to Rice, Oxford, Princeton, even after all of that, I still did not consider myself to be smart. Because there was this tape playing in the back of my head saying, you're not good enough. You're not smart enough. You're going to fail. Now for me, that was hard to overcome. And what I want to talk about for the rest of our time is how I overcame that. Because it wasn't easy. And a big way that I got through it was actually in the scripture that we read today. So I want to bring that up and I want to look at it. 
It says, have faith in God, truly I tell you, if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and if you do not doubt in your heart, but believe that what you say will come to pass, it will be done for you. Now, when I first read this scripture, I can tell you that for me, I read it very literally, like probably many of you are, right? Are you imagining him saying like, hey, mountain, go into the sea, and that's what happens, right? Okay, but I came to realize that what he's saying here, he's using this as a visualization. So, I want you to imagine that you're walking down a path, okay? You're going down a path, and as you go down, you eventually see, off in the distance, that there is this mountain. The mountain reaches all the way up into the clouds. You can see it. It's tall, and it blocks your way. Now you have two choices when you come to that mountain that's standing in your way. You can either accept your limitations and stay there and not move forward, or you're going to figure out a way to move past that mountain. In the same way, in our lives, many of us, we come to these mountains, these places where we have to look at our limitations and we feel that they are insurmountable, that we can't move past them. For me, that was my intelligence. That was the mountain in my life. And no matter how many different ways I tried to prove to myself that I could get past it, I simply could not. And so what happened to me was that I started reading this scripture very, very closely. And the part that really got to me was this. If you do not doubt in your heart but believe that what you say will come to pass, it will be done for you. Now, what I failed to realize early on is that at a fundamental level, I simply did not believe that I was smart. Do you understand what I'm saying? Even though I was out there trying to prove to everyone else, going to all these schools, doing all these things, saying, look at me, I'm smart, I can do these things, Fundamentally, I did not believe it to be true, and therefore, it was impossible for me to move that mountain in my life. I couldn't get past it. And so, I think that for many of us, we have to realize what Jesus is saying here. That if you believe, then there's a potential to move the mountain. But if you don't start with the belief nothing can happen. Are you following me on this? Okay, so the way I reprogrammed my subconscious to get past this tape that was playing in the back of my mind, you're not good enough, you're not smart enough, you're going to fail, was that I literally had to consciously sit there and say, you are good enough, you are smart enough, and everything is going to be okay. Now, it's not like I said that like three times and I was like, all right, well, I'm all better, good, I'm glad I did that, okay. Moving on, it took a long time. It's like you learning how to drive a car, right? Like you're out there, you're driving, and you're using your conscious brain, and it takes a long time to reprogram your subconscious. But if I'm going to be totally transparent with you in this, the reality is I came to to find out about myself that really the intelligence was secondary for me. That I came to understand that at a fundamental level, I did not believe I had worth and value as a human being. And so, as I was going through this, I realized I needed to deal with that first, and then I was going to be able to deal with this intelligence issue. And of course, I turned to Jesus again for this, because Jesus tells us that what God believes is that every single human being has worth and value, that there is nothing a person can do to strip them of that worth and value. And so once I eventually believed that to be true, then I could actually work on this intelligence issue, my negative feelings about that. But it wasn't just like an easy thing where you just jump forward and it's no problem, right? I had to work, fail, readjust, work, fail, readjust until eventually success. And with each success, it started to overwrite that program that was playing in the back of my mind. But here's the thing. You have to realize this. Belief is not simply intellectual. 
It is not something that you can simply say in your mind and it'll just happen. Belief is the result of action. So go back to the analogy of the mountain, right? You're standing in front of the mountain and you sit there and you say, I believe I can move past this mountain. And you just stand there. Nothing's going to happen. You have to be able to move over the mountain. You can believe it, but you have to put that belief into action. You've got to get over the mountain. You've got to get around it. You have to start going if you're going to make a difference in your life. I would say in all, it took me about 10 years to finally move that mountain in my life. Now, I don't want you to be discouraged by my timeline here because the truth is that the more you believe it, the deeper you believe it, the more you put that belief into action, the quicker you can move that mountain. But the starting point is belief. And that's why we read that first scripture today where Jesus is healing that demon-possessed boy. And remember, Jesus says, all things can be done for the one who believes. And the father cries out, he says, I believe, help my unbelief. All of us have fears. All of us have doubts. And those fears and doubts, they are playing in that tape in the back of your mind. Now, for some of you, those fears and those doubts, they're very soft. You can barely hear them. But for others of you, those fears and doubts are quite loud. They are very prominent. And they actually define who you are as a person. If you believe that you're a failure, you're going to be a failure. If you believe you're unintelligent, you're going to be unintelligent. If you believe that you deserve to be abused, you will be abused. And so what I want you to leave you with today is this notion that if you believe that it can go the other way, if you believe you have worth and value, if you believe that whatever the mountain is in your life that needs to be moved, and I have my mountain that I needed to move, you all have your own. Whatever that mountain might be, it can be moved, but you start with belief. And so my hope for you is that whatever that mountain is, I hope you reflect on it and think, what is it that needs to be moved in my life? I hope that you will step back and I hope that you will consider it and I hope you will reach out and say, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Amen.